Hey, Richard, welcome to Mass Mocha. Thank you, Michael. You're here for the Michael Oatman personal tour. Thanks for taking us uh, to Mass Mocha and for giving us the Michael Oatman tour. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, well, I thought we'd start here because this is really the site of one of my first encounters um, with the museum and with somebody who would become a, a, a friend. Um, this is Tree Logic by Natalie Jeremijenko. And it's a piece that was part of the second show at Mass Mocha wow. called Unnatural Science. What year would that have been, roughly? 2000. Wow. And so Natalie's piece was really um, the new public image for Mass Mocha. Yeah. And now it's in its 19th year. Amazing. I think dozens of trees have been retired to a hillside after they've done their service <laughs> here upside down. Because people are very... They're service trees. They're service like trees service and people are concerned about them. Yeah. And so uh, it's good for people to know that they actually go on to live a free range, well, yeah. sort of life <laughs> after they've been upside down for so long. And this lobby actually is a great part of the story of Mass Mocha. Because, you know, in almost every other museum, you come in and you are in the museum. There's no more windows, right? Because of all the things surrounding the conservation of art. But as soon as you come into Mass Mocha, it's light filled. You see straight through the building into the courtyards. And there's this magnificent desk, which was built, um, I believe, by my friend Richard Criddle and designed by some of the engineers at Bruner Cott. And it tells you right away that this isn't, you know, a museum as usual. There's this massive spring and everything about the construction of the desk and the way that they decided to sort of keep their hands off the surfaces in here tells you that this used to be a factory. And now it's a factory for art, I think, as they like to say. So um, over the years, they've added this, the bookstore, the rolling shelves, the bikes that you can now take around as part of the Mass Mocha Transit pro uh, Project. So um, I think this lobby gives you plenty of architectural and historical cues that lets you know how you can see this museum and how you can be here. So Julianne Swartz's uh, the tonal hallway is an existing structure that's been outfitted with carefully designed speakers and a sonic environment designed by the audience. And I'll shut up for a minute so you can experience some of that and then we'll walk down together. And so in addition to hearing the composition, the materiality of the walkway also tempers how you hear the sound. I think Mocha's own research has shown that a certain percentage of people come to the museum, not for the art, but for the building. It's kind of a marvel of historic renovation and preservation. Um, the architect of um, record was the recently deceased Caesar Pelli, and the engineering firm is Bruner Cott out of Boston. We're here at the entrance to the second floor of three floors at Mass Mocha, dedicated to the art of Saul Lewitt. And Lewitt, as the named father of conceptual art is famous for this sentence that the concept is the machine that makes the art. And one of the things that I love about, about Mass Mocha is this is like a kind of ready-made teaching situation. You can come here, you can not only learn about art, right, but you kind of learn about how Mass Mocha regards the audience. And they're interested in bringing people into communion with art, right? So that's why they often help artists realize massive projects, things that they might not be able to do on their own. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, this is a team effort of 60 artists working for half a year to precisely interpret LeWitt's instructions for making these drawings. And one of the beautiful things about this is that LeWitt may be the only artist I know of who will be making new work after he's dead. So think about this. If the set of instructions that the collector of the museum buys says, on a wall, bisect it vertically, bisect it horizontally, and then bisect each of those zones with pencil, and then bisect each of those zones with a wavy hand-drawn line. He's not saying, if you'll notice, on a 10-foot wall. That wall could be three feet wide or 100 feet wide. And because of the site specificity of the work, you'll always get a new, if you will, piece. And so this place becomes a machine for teaching students about ways of approaching art, not just about making it, but ways to kind of be with art. And of course, you know, I wanted a work or several works here 
that would play into that pedagogy, if you will, of the museum. So I think even if you don't know a ton about art, when you learn that the artist, him or herself, didn't physically make these, but that a team of people was able to do it based on instructions, then I think you understand the power of communication within this slightly different realm that we call art. One of the stories that I like telling my architecture students about this building is that um, when they first decided to turn this into the LeWitt building, which I think a reviewer for the LA Reader called America's Sistine Chapel, um, they decided to leave the walls the way they were and instead put all of the heating, ventilating, and air conditioning in these new built walls, right? So you don't hear any sounds from that. Um, all of the brick is left in its beautifully kind of deteriorated and palimpsest kind of state. But the one amazing thing that I was privy to in the actual construction was um, a construction crew set up a bunch of planers in the parking lot and they took the old floors out, replaned them and milled up new wood and then of course finally set this new floor above that. So you saw a building kind of being dismantled and then put back together again, um, almost as a kind of performance event. And I think you can see that um, you can't just call these walls, they're, they're art. It's, you know, it's on the wall, of course, but um, the, the heating and ventilating system is not separate from it, it is of it. Um, and so I think that's what makes this such a beautiful experience, to kind of walk around and know that every inch of this wall was touched by a person who was realizing the design of, at that point, um, a deceased artist. You know, the old saying is, if you wanted to do something new, you have to do something new, right? And so this idea about um, how the life of the factory translated into an art viewing experience, I think is profound, you know. Sprague Electric, which was the previous tenant before Mass Mocha, um, had 4,000 employees, many of them women, and there were a number of choral groups that would perform at lunch. Mm. Right, so there's a, a direct connection to that ethos of the bang on a can concept, you know, as, as it is visited on this museum every year. And before that, you had um, the Arnold's Print Works, which was in some ways sort of the American version of what uh, now is perceived in business as a kind of culture of theft from China, which are making American products. Arnold Printworks used to rip off English cloth designs oh. and produce them on the cheap and sell them here in America where that was an import business. And so I think that this idea of turning the museum inside out or on its head only works when you have something really interesting that you can point to. I've never seen a museum that is so given to and open to documentaries, performances, yes, yes. Um, pop-up events tolerating and encouraging a local group of musicians to play here every weekend. This may be my favorite um, space here in the LeWitt building um, because you see essentially a kind of tonal composition on this side and then you see the inflection of a color introduced here. And, and because my students are architecture students who are the cousins of uh, engineers in a way, um, I think they very quick, quickly grasp the interestingness of the idea that we're looking at um, non-repeated arrangements of relationships from one set of squares to another. And so the room nominally looks the same everywhere, but it's actually different. Like wherever you, whenever you look at a, a situation between four panels, you will not see the same thing. And the other thing is that you know, all these drawings are made really physically with the hand, so you kind of sense after the taping off happens and the registration lines of pencils go in, how this stuff is being pushed in, right? And how they're working really hard to get consistent values, but you can't because it's drywall. And so what you get is that sort of elaboration on this idea that, um, maybe an Islamic idea, that you know, only, only Allah can make a perfect thing. In some ways, this is a real manifestation of like, a certain amount of humanness within perfection. And I think my students really love that concept, you know, because they're architects and they're thinking all the time about how can I make something that conforms to certain standards of like safety and material use and keeps costs down, but also reflects me as a designer. 
And, you know, LeWitt, I think, is one of the great makers of um, policy for artists in a way. Like, you know, all of these rules are up to you as the artist to set in motion and to follow or to break in some way. And um, I've found a lot of non-artists really falling in love with art in these rooms. So the instruction for this drawing is take every corner and connect it to every non-parallel corner, something along those lines. And so this is all using chalk line or snap lines. And it's great because you see that this corner is already conceptually connected to this corner because it's the architecture. But you can't add that line to any closer corner than that one, right? So, um, and obviously there are more things in the middle than on the bottom, so you get a flurry of activity at eye level up, essentially. And then, um, I mean, this is the kind of thing that makes a person never look at a room in the same way again, right? That there are implied relationships between things. Um, and never has a, a, an, air condition, air, an air ventilation duct look better <laughs> than when it's not trying to be hidden, but when it's actually like the focus of the room. So this is Trent Doyle Hancock's massive installation, The Mind of the Mound. And you know, not only is this the biggest single gallery in America, um, it is, I think, the room that certain artists really want. I want, I want this room someday, <laughs> to yeah. be perfectly honest. Trent Doyle Hancock has been drawing cartoons and comic books about these imagined characters that are sort of allegories for his life since he was 12 years old. And so what you hear, see here is a museum giving this artist permission to make physical things that have been like limited to the sketchbook. I think for me a show like this is, is kind of a reminder of what I think we do as artists, right? Uh, I think if you want to bring people to your work, you almost have to create a world and bring them into it, right? Whether it's a, a world of, of forms and abstraction or if it's a world of stories, which is you know kind of how we think about and how we make the world. Um, but I think every artist is always thinking about the dichotomy of you know making something on your own and then suddenly and maybe artificially having an audience for it, right? So we spend an awful lot of time making things by ourselves. Uh, and then there's some sort of switch that is flipped and then we look to get it in front of people. This is not the same experience that you have when you go into a place like the Frick, right? Where in some cases, artworks have hung in the same place for 50 years or 100 years. Um, I think the, the ethos of this room is um, change, massiveness, massive experimentation, the invitation to the artist, the dialogue with the curator, uh, and, and maybe in some cases it's more possible to have a dialogue with the public here than in a quiet museum, right? You get to see how people look at the work. And as I said before, you also, in a place like Mass Mocha, get to see people having first-time encounters with themselves as art viewers, right? Not just the first time they've seen art, but like, what kind of permissions are you given as a viewer here, and what, which ones do you take advantage of?